everyone. This is Amanda Borchel Dan. And I'm Jessica Steinberg, your host for Times Will Tell, a weekly podcast from the Times of Israel. Hello, Times Will Tell listeners. It's Jessica Steinberg, and I'm here this week with Lena Glickson, who is part of the Emmy winning 2022 sound editing team for Netflix's Stranger Things. I don't know about you, but my family was riveted by all seasons of this extremely creepy hit. I had to cover my face with a pillow for many parts of it, but I kept with it. Uh, My 14-year-old sons were finally turned on to the music of the 80s, my music, with this stellar soundtrack that features the Talking Heads, the Police, Madonna, Metallica, Cyndi Lauper, many others, and of course, the virally popular scene featuring Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill. Lena, so you're asking, why is Lena Glickson on The Times Will Tell? Lena um, has Jewish roots, grew up in Russia, has been living in the U.S. for many years. We'll talk more about that. And uh, as I said, she's part of the editing team. And of course, bottom line of interest to anyone who watches Stranger Things, she helped slingshot this 80s song to the top of the charts. So, of course, that's why we're interested in having you here with us. We're also interested in finding out about your Jewish background and life in the U.S. and how you're affected by the ongoing war in Ukraine, of course, and... I think there's a little bit of an Israel story there as well. So first of all, Lena, welcome. We're so happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be part of your podcast. I think we're going to have to start with Stranger Things. Tell us really from a more recent past, uh, when and how you joined the Stranger Things music crew and a little about, about development of music for this show. Uh, so season four of Stranger Things is my first season on the show. Uh-huh. Um, I've been working as a music editor in Hollywood for the past six years at this point. And yeah, receiving this email from David Klotz, the music editor uh, for all of the seasons of the show was kind of surprising. And I couldn't even believe it because <laughs> I actually was a big fan of the show. And I watched all the seasons and I was one of the people Googling the release date for <laughs> season four. <laughs> so I literally thought that it's like a junk mail or something when, when I saw that. Um, and yeah, it was it was real. And apparently the Duffer brothers were looking for the second music editor because the episodes in season four are so long. Uh, many uh, different processes were happening in parallel. So uh, while uh, one episode was dubbed, meaning the sound for the episode was mixed, uh, the Duffer brothers were already cutting and working on the, f- the following episode. So poor David, the music editor, would have to be to place simultaneously. And the Duffer brothers needed someone who would be actually working with them in the cutting room every single day. And that person was me. And it was just an amazing experience. Uh, I was spending a lot of time with with the Duffer Brothers and we were working very closely on the music, both the score and the source pieces. And of course, Running Up That Hill was uh, one of the songs that we worked uh, closely on. And it was just amazing. And they gave me so much creative freedom and just things to experiment with. And they, uh, they trust me to a point where they can just, you know, uh, bring up a few pieces from the previous seasons and tell me, Elena, can't you uh, cut this one over here or that one over there? So there was a lot of um, appropriation where I kind of had to take pre-existing piece of music and then place it in a new scene and actually make it work in that context, which is always a very, very fun thing to do. And the entire crew is just so lovely and amazing. And the vibes you're getting from the show, it's so interesting because these positive, friendly vibes, they actually live in the cutting room, which is a very unique thing, I think, even from my experience. No, to hear that is, it's certainly gratifying in a sense, uh, as a fan and a viewer to hear that. So, Talk to us a little bit about how the music gets chosen. I didn't even use the names the Duffer Brothers, who, of course, the brothers who created Stranger Things. And where do the ideas for the music of using the 80s soundtrack, I assume it's from them. I have read about that, you know, here and there. 
But to really dig into these 80s classics that have, of course, you know, last until today, even without Stranger Things, where does that inspiration come from? How much, what is it work? What is it like to work as part of the music editing team and to make the decisions about this song or that song? the other song or another song. Yeah, usually how it works, especially with bigger songs, many of those are already scripted. And it's a combination of, it's basically teamwork. Um, At some point it becomes about, you know, licensing, how much money do we have to spend on the music and um, where can we save a bit uh, if we can pick certain alternatives for some of the songs but uh when it comes to big songs i think most of them are kind of predetermined and it's a combination of a director's work and showrunner's work and we also have our amazing music supervisor nora felder who helps us providing alternatives for certain songs and also um she does all the all the licensing for the show and in terms of um you know on uh, picking and choosing songs, uh, basically, if we need some options, then Nora would come up with a number of different songs, and I would be the person cutting them in um, into the scene, basically, and showing them to the Duffer Brothers, because obviously all the songs are different tempo, different length, and my job, just as a music editor in general, is to make a particular piece of music work sync-wise and dramatically within a certain scene and make it all very musical so that it develops beautifully and works with the picture and all the important sync points are there. So that's how I present songs to the Duffer Brothers and uh, any director or showrunner, basically. And uh, that's what helps them choose which ones they want. And then sometimes we're just narrowing down the choice to two, three different pieces and then go from there. Got it. So... I would love to dig in a little bit to Running Up That Hill and Kate Bush. Let's, we're going to listen for a moment to a snapshot of the scene uh, in season four in which Max, played by Sadie Sink, is able to overcome the powerful curse. I'm not going to get too much into this. Spoiler alert for those who have not gotten to season four yet. And she's able to overcome the curse by hearing her favorite song. <laughs> They can't help you, Max. There's a reason you hide from them. We now heard that bit of the scene, not too much of it, again, because we're protecting those who have not gotten to season four yet. So talk to us a little bit about um, that particular song, Kate Bush is Running Up That Hill, which of course was very popular and has been for a long time, but really it it becomes such an indelible moment in the season. I know that... uh that was supposed to be a very, very big moment. And uh, when I saw the song for the very first time, I was instructed and told that, okay, so this is the scene. This is our (laughs) feature song. Please be super careful about cutting it and (laughs) make sure that that it all works. And you cut it a lot, Lena. You, You cut, I mean, it's interesting. I was listening to it again. There's a lot of cuts in it until you get the big chunk of it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the way it works really uh, in the movie world is that the songs and the music is being cut to picture and very rarely it works vice versa. So the song always has to be adjusted in one way or the other. And to be honest, uh, there are so many different stories about how 
uh, <laughs> the song was picked for the series. <laughs> so <laughs> I, choose one. I'm not gonna choose one. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, one of them is that it, it was scripted. The other one is that uh, the direct, uh, director of that particular episode, Sean Levy, brought it in, and uh, so <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to go getting into, involved. Yeah, but um, the way it was originally cut, um, it was cut by Dean Zimmerman, our picture editor, and um, it was just a very kind of rough shape of the song and my job was basically just making it work within the scene and making it develop in a certain way and we actually even had to adjust the picture a little bit to kind of uh, make the song shine which happens very very rarely it just tells you about how important this song was for the episode and for the season Right. And for me personally, the other interesting experience was cutting the same song uh, in episode nine during this big epic montage where it's not just the, uh, the main version of the song, but it's the remix by uh, the artist Totem. And uh, that one was fun because originally in that scene we were supposed to have score and then the Duffa brothers just brought it in and said, oh, we have this cool version of the Kate Bush song uh, and it's a remix and let's try cutting it in. And basically I had all the separate instruments and elements for the remix. So just assembling such an epic <laughs> version of that song for that scene was amazing and when the Duffa brothers saw it they were uh they really loved it and it was just such uh, such a happy moment for me when uh they actually fell in love with something that I did and I was the first person who kind of tried doing it uh so it, it was very very cool and uh that sequence actually also lives on YouTube, I believe, as a, as a separate video. Uh, because again, it's a very rare thing, I think, when uh, a song um, and the sequence, the video s sequence, they, they live together and you can actually watch them separately from the episode, which kind of shows that people also like that one and were interested. And uh, it was cool reading the comments on YouTube. I can never associate myself kind of with, with my work, so I'm still <laughs> working on that. But uh, yeah, people also loved it. And that makes me very, very happy. We're going to turn to you now because I want to understand um, how this person who trained in piano and trained in voice and did a lot of classical music training, as I understand, how you made your way to sound editing. I'm very curious about that. Was that always your goal? Did that become your goal along the way? Please tell us some of that story. Well, uh, as a child, my dream was actually to become a professional singer. Mm -hmm. And I think I start, started playing piano mostly because I wanted to be a singer and there was no official way of studying voice okay. uh, in, uh, back in Russia. And I was always doing the two things in parallel. And also because there was nowhere to study um, jazz vocals or pop vocals. When it came to choosing uh, like a career path when I was still living back in Russia, it's surprising and it's a bit weird, but uh, out of all the options that I had, I picked um, classical music theory. Uh, and I think partially it's because my parents are uh, programmers and <laughs> they are <laughs> in IT and they're... <laughs> Uh, there was something about that, uh, just like the specific way uh, my brain works and kind of the, the logical component to the artistic component. And just that particular major appealed to me simply because it was a combination of both. Uh, but my goal was still to be uh, to become a, a singer. So that's how I discovered Berklee College of Music in Boston. Or how many years ago did you come from Russia to the U.S.? Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Ah, so not that long. Yeah, but that that's still the third of my life, so... <laughs> Got it. No, 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 sure. But I'm just wondering yeah. at what stage. Okay, so you really... your Most of your education was in, was in Russia. And where in Russia did yeah. you live? Where did you uh, grow up? Voronezh. It's a city really, really close to Ukraine. It's pretty much on the border with Ukraine. I was also considering a Riemann School of Music in Israel and kind of choosing between the two in a way. Mm. 
but also kind of thinking that maybe after a couple of years um, at Raymond, I would probably be able to go to Berkeley. Uh, but the thing was that I I didn't speak Hebrew, and I thought that that was kind of a bigger issue. Uh, uh, I spoke English, so that 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 was one of the main reasons why I actually went to Berkeley, just to be able to absorb as much knowledge as as I could. We're going to take a quick break from my conversation with Lena Glickson, part of the Emmy-winning 2022 sound editing team for Netflix's Stranger Things. Hey, podcast listeners. As you know, Israeli cooking is taking the world by storm. Now here's your chance to join in. The Times of Israel is excited to present our new virtual cooking series, Bete Avon, where expert chefs show you how to make classic and modern Israeli dishes. After you join the Times of Israel community, you'll have the opportunity to ask live questions to a series of well-known chefs such as Susie Fishbein and the Hala Prince. Can't make it to a live session? The workshops are recorded for you to watch at your leisure. TOI community members get exclusive access to all previous recordings and future sessions. To participate, join the Times of Israel community. There's a link to join on our homepage and every single page on the site. Enjoy! We're back to my interview with Lena Glickson who is part of the Emmy-winning 2022 sound editing team. She's going to tell us a little bit about her path from Russia to the States, about her Jewish identity, and her wishes to be in Israel. Tell us a little bit about your path from Boston to L.A. Well, what I realized at Berkeley, again, was that <laughs> oh, my dream of becoming a singer was, was a lovely dream, but uh, I just had way too much classical background to kind of <laughs> <laughs> forget about that and only concentrate on performance. Uh, and because Berkeley has to offer a number of very unique majors, and one of those was film scoring, I felt like that would be an amazing way of combining my more technical and logical side with a very, very creative orchestral writing and just kind of using all my knowledge, basically. Uh, and uh, that's why I came to Los Angeles, because with such a degree, this is kind of the number one place in the world. I would think so. And um, because music editing was one of the classes that we had to take as uh, the film scoring students, I considered it as one of the options for myself. And the first internship that I found was with a music editor, Nick South. And I already had kind of all, all the knowledge about uh, creating a score for movies and how it all works and who is involved um, and had the basic technical skills, but I needed those specific skills for music editing. Uh, and my mentor, Nick, taught me pretty much everything he knew and he was just amazing in terms of explaining me not only the technicalities but also the political side of the job because that's another very very important side of it explain please what is the political side well you know a music editor is a person who lives between all the parties involved in creating the music and we act uh, as some sort of a bridge between the director and the composer and the studio uh so a lot of the times our job is to um, save the composer from being fired or, you know, save the movie from all the music being thrown away. And um, it has a lot to do with just uh, understanding people, feeling the room, making sure you are protecting everyone that needs to be protected, making sure that we stay on schedule, communicating with the movie studio, communicating with the director. And sometimes, you know, the composer, let's say, sends me a piece of score and I know that the director is in a really, really bad mood. And I know that I can't show that piece of score to the director at the moment. So I need to figure out a way to find the best time to do that. And, you know, it's it's a lot of figuring out what you can say, what you cannot say, how to save this person, how to protect that person, uh, and problem solving, troubleshooting, and just resolving conflicts. This is a very different direction in a sense, even though you've been doing it for a long time, than where you started as a musician. 
um, as a singer. Do you do? You, is there a sense of? I imagine there's a sense of satisfaction from what you do now, even though it is a long road from where you began. Is there a sense of satisfaction? For sure. Uh, of course, uh, I kind of miss. Uh, the performance element a bit because I just don't have the time to do that anymore. But I feel like there are no skills that are completely abandoned and unused because in one way or the other, even my singing skills, because I often work on musicals. And for instance, now I work on a remake of The Color Purple and there are many, many songs uh, in that movie. So uh, just having that background, knowing about vocal position, knowing about uh, just how to use your voice helps me a lot as a music editor when I'm working on musicals. And of course, all my classical background helps me with the editing bit of it. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's been a very interesting journey. And I probably could never imagine <laughs> working in Hollywood and doing what I do when I was little and I, when I was dreaming of being on stage and performing. But it's still very exciting. There's been a lot of upheaval in the last months, given what's been happening with the war in Ukraine. Um, I don't know where your family is right now. If you have family in Ukraine, where has that put all of you in terms of your own personal life and what you're thinking about, both in terms of career and home? For me, what happened on February 24th, when Russia attacked Ukraine, was a personal tragedy in a way. Uh, I do not have family in Ukraine, but just the fact that the city where I was born is so close to the border with Ukraine. And, um, you know, especially in my town, it's actually very hard to say, oh, this person is 100% Russian and that person is 27% uh, Ukrainian. Uh, it's all very, very mixed. And um, I have many friends from Ukraine. Uh, and I thought, okay, so now the Russians are going to actually see what happened and what our government is like. But that did not happen. And that made me feel <sighs> devastated, to be honest. Uh, like the whole world started crashing and burning. And when I was living in Russia, I was kind of suffering a bit with my identity because uh, I was born with my dad's Jewish last name, which is Glickson. But when I turned three years old, my mom changed her last name and my last name to her maiden name, which sounds way more Slavic. And that's actually still the last name that I have in my passport, Nizhelska, just because swastikas were, uh, you know, all over, all over the city and anti-Semitism was kind of flourishing. Uh, so I was growing up with this idea that I have Jewish roots, but I kind of have to hide them from everyone. And living in a pretty conservative society where uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is still kind of a big thing. And, uh, uh, you know, everyone, all the kids in my class were wearing crosses and kids would ask me, so have you ever been baptized? And I've never been baptized. And it just felt very uncomfortable. And I had this feeling that, okay, I need to hide my identity. I shouldn't be telling anyone that I have Jewish roots, uh, even though I felt very, very strong connection to those. Uh, and when I became a teenager that was already in, uh, you know, late 2000s, um, the climate in the society started, started changing a bit. Um, and uh, the Jewish community in my hometown um, started having different activities and celebrating high holidays. So it started to feel like it's not as dangerous as it used to, to be Jewish and to be kind of open about it. Uh, but it was still very difficult because we had so many decades of that part of who we are kind of being hidden. Uh, and the generation of my grandparents was the first generation who started experiencing that and started hiding their Jewish identity because they couldn't really celebrate any high holidays. That's why the generation of my parents grew up completely, you know, uh, Soviet as opposed to having their um, ethnicities kind of cherished and respected. Um, 
so um yeah that that was that was a very interesting moment in my life and uh when i started feeling more jewish that's when i started discovering more things about uh, my jewish heritage and learning more about the holocaust because that's an important part of my family history. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he left Poland in 1939 and his uh, family um, was exterminated in one of the first exterminating camps in Poland. Uh, so for me, that was this uh, generational trauma that was uh, living very, very deep inside. And uh, for many years, I was reading a lot about it, was reading a lot about the Holocaust, trying to understand that. And kind of circling back to, uh, you know, February 24th, just from my personal experience, knowing so much about the war, knowing so, ma so much about what happened with the Jews, and even living in Russia, it, it's not just me, I have my personal story, a story with the Jewish heritage and background, but going through the Second World War for all the Russian families was also devastating. And everyone has um, ancestors who died in the Second World War and served in the army. And it's this huge tragedy and people all of a sudden were manipulating into saying that okay, we have such a great past and we won over the Nazis in uh, 1945 and now we're going to do the same thing again. And for me, the two dots, they don't connect the Nazis they were fighting against in 1941, 1945 are not the same Nazis they're fighting against today. Uh, and the fact that it was so easy for the society to believe into this huge, huge, huge lie. Um, just made me feel like I, I don't feel connected to the place where I was born anymore. Your parents are there. Yes, uh, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but my I'm mom uh, still lives there. And uh, for me, it's very difficult because, you know, even during the pandemic, it was very, very hard for me to travel just because uh, I'm not a US citizen. I'm here on a work visa and uh, Russia has horrible relationships with the United States. So getting a visa in Russia is impossible. All the other countries in the world would only issue visas to their own citizens. So, uh, and when my dad passed away, I wasn't even able to go back home for his funeral. Oh uh, and just, I, I always feel stuck between, you know, all these different factors. And again, like this war in, in Ukraine, there are so many things that uh, I don't support um, that have something to do with the politics, of course, and with, with the government. And... Uh, I can't be associating myself with that place anymore. And because I have so many ties to my Jewish heritage, and I've always been thinking about becoming a part of Israel, because it's, again, it's a very important part of who I am and my identity. And only when I came to the United States, I felt like, okay, I can finally be more open about being Jewish. Right. Uh, and when I was at Berkeley, most of my recitals were actually uh, me singing Jewish music and Ashkenazi music. Wow. Um, and uh, I, I would never be able to do that in Russia. And for me, that th this was an incredible opportunity, just exploring who I am, uh, exploring the music. And I feel very, very connected with that music. You've had a lot of different journeys, basically. You've had this professional journey, and you've had this very personal, familial, and, and individual journey. And I would imagine that the decision to get Israeli citizenship has to do with the personal journey, and also what is happening with a lot of Russian citizens now who have either left or are thinking about leaving. Obviously, there are thousands in Israel who also have Jewish roots and who are saying, I don't want anything to do with Russia anymore. You had already been in the U.S., so you're in a different position. And of course, to tie it all together, you've also made great strides professionally, uh, having a very exciting career moment, uh, and I imagine many moments. Where does that put you personally and professionally? Uh, you know, right now I'm kind of uh, at this place with my career where 
everything keeps changing and I keep seeing different opportunities uh, and everything keeps developing so, so fast. Of course, long term, I would love to work uh, on an Israeli movie as well. Um, I think language is a very big thing and uh, I am learning Hebrew right now, even though I'm not in Israel, but I, I do feel like it's a very important thing and it's something that, again, brings me back to my roots and connects me to my ancestors, uh, even though... Uh, my grandparents they spoke Yiddish but but still uh, I feel like it's just an important part of who I am and as soon as uh, you know my Hebrew basically turns into something that I can use professionally then it would be much much easier and uh, more convenient for me and uh, the filmmakers to work on, let's say, Israeli movie. And I know that there are many Israelis working in Hollywood, and I would love to get to know them and potentially collaborate uh, on a project uh, that that would actually be amazing. Uh, right now, the world is just changing so fast, and I'm, you know, just trying every day something new happens. And I'm trying to kind of protect myself, protect my family where I can, uh, and just basically watching the world change every single second. So I hope that very, very soon we'll come to a point where things will stabilize and hopefully the war in Ukraine will stop as soon as possible and I will be able to kind of take a breather and just absorb everything that's going on and plan accordingly right now everything feels like chaos I hear you yeah it's hard to avoid that feeling these days very much so and I'm sure that working with wonderful teams like in Stranger Things or in other projects that you're involved in helps on that day-to-day -day basis to say, okay, this is my art, this is my profession, this is my music, and I'd really like to focus on this. Let's turn back to the beginning of the conversation a little bit and tell us a little bit about your musical dreams in terms of the work that you're doing. Israeli films, Israeli TV shows, that sounds great, but even beyond that, in terms of your voice, in terms of your editing work, what are some of the things that you think about? You know, right now, ideally, I feel like it would be very, very nice, no matter where I am in the world geographically, uh, but just finding that balance between uh, work that's very, very crazy and very intense and <laughs> art. Um, before the war in Ukraine, I also used to um, write music for a local theater in my hometown, which was an amazing a way of just self-expression artistry um, and I do miss that I don't think it's possible to do the same thing keep doing it and especially again considering everything else that's going on in the world at the moment it's just unsafe for both parties me and the theater I used to work with to collaborate but doing something like that and finding the time for it is definitely an amazing thing and um, I was also recording songs for those uh, theater productions and this is kind of the the dream job in a way where you don't have to do it for the money you can just do it for the sake of you know the artistic pleasure basically uh and you know in terms of the movies of course uh i can i can work even on bigger shows and it, yes i definitely have certain um topics like for instance schindler's list is one of my favorite movies and working with let's say steven spielberg or working on a movie about holocaust because as i <laughs> as i already mentioned it's a very 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 important part of my identity and it's a very unique type of music and type of score that a movie like that requires and maybe not necessarily even editing the music for a movie like that maybe writing music for a movie like that that would definitely be a big big dream for me Lena Glickson, we hope that you get to fulfill these dreams. We certainly hoped, I certainly hope I get to interview over here uh, in Israel while you're working on some project or living here or commuting back and forth. Whatever happens, we really hope to keep in touch with you. And final question, next season of Stranger Things, are you working on it yet? Tell us. Have my, have my fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> we wish you much, much luck in this new year and only good things. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for listening to Times Will Tell from the Times of Israel. And thanks to our producer, Gilad Brownstein. Please subscribe wherever you find your podcast and check out our daily briefing news show every Sunday through Thursday. Like what you hear? Consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to spread the word. Until next week. Shalom. Shalom.